the hell? Why would you buy something and spend money on something to deliver a program to your clients when you have no clients and no program? Doesn't that seem ass backwards to you? Right? So why not <laughs> either? I mean, what, I mean, obviously my suggestion is do the online trainer Academy, get clients and then get the software and plug them in afterwards. Right. But even if you don't do the online trainer Academy, like bust your butt, get those clients first. This is the online trainer show, trainer show, trainer show. This is the online trainer show. We shouldn't have a podcast. So here we are. And what, what episode is this, Amber? 55, 53, 52. 52. 52. It's a good number. Good number, 52. So we, on our last episode of the podcast, we were talking about the U.S. presidential election, which uh, basically equates to like a potato sack race at a elementary school field day at this point. So we, we're still unaware of what's going on here. Canada's tuned in to the meth lab downstairs once again. Wondering what the noise is and what the smell is. And, we, you know, we're just living a dream down here in the States. I'm back here with my emotional support Canadians, Catalina Belmarez and Jonathan Goodman. Howdy. And you know what's funny, Jonathan? The post you shared the other day, it was somebody's computer desktop. And, it, oh, and they only yeah, had yeah. two files on the desktop. The first file was memes. And the other file was the link to Canadian citizenship. Yeah, <laughs> they were like prepared either way. <laughs> no matter what happens, they're prepared. No matter what happens, I'm either going to go with these memes or I'm going to go with Canadian citizenship. I think that's an appropriate, appropriate. I thought I thought that was pretty funny. That, that was, was yeah. pretty funny. Man. Reddit's been doing really well for me. Re oh, really? <laughs> in, in the last couple of days, Reddit's been your source of political commentary. Reddit's been my source of political comedy. Good for you, Jonathan. Yeah. I actually, the last couple of days, I've been flipping back and forth between Fox and CNN. Me too. I love because it. Because I think it's interesting getting the two, the two viewpoints. Like, especially whenever votes come in or something like that, it's been interesting getting the two viewpoints. Interestingly, I mean, by the time people listen to this, the election is going to be done. And like, yeah. Yeah, no, you it, know, so it's, it's stupid that we're talking about this. But interestingly, is. Fox called Arizona like a day and a half ago for Biden. And right. CNN still hasn't. Right, right. Which is odd. But I, I just like the duality of the two places. I mean, let, let me be clear here. And I, this might be a great endorsement of the OTA and all of its properties. I don't know. It could be a horrible endorsement. It's not like I care. It's, my name's not on the thing. But I mean, let's just be honest here. Like, I'm not going down. Nobody, nobody's coming after me for anything. They'll come straight for Jonathan, possibly Amber. Kettle and I'll be fine. But one of the greatest sort of endorsements I can have of the OTA is that as a person who votes, I vote. Voting is good. Like, you should vote. It's important. You have the right and, you, you know, you vote. I'm not immediately hampered by the, the political process. I see a lot of anxiety, right? Everybody's talking about anxiety. Are you anxious? So, somebody asked me the other day, they said, on a scale of one to 10, wh where's your anxiety with this campaign? I was like, I'm right around a two. I'm anxious that I'm probably going to fall asleep before anything gets announced. And that's probably the limit of my anxiety right now, because the truth is, as an OTA coach, I've been through several administrations at this point. I've been through right. a liberal administration. I've been through a conservative administration. I've been through, and same with the Senate. I've been in a, in a liberal dominated Senate and a conservative dominated. And you know what? I've made money in all, in all those administrations. Like, and it's a reality. Now I have a concern for human, human rights and things like that. If you see me speaking out on Facebook, you, you, I'll talk a lot about that. I don't talk a lot about politics because it's like somebody who likes anchovies and somebody who doesn't. Like, what do I care what your political leanings? You're probably thinking whatever's best for you, that's what you vote for. I get that. I don't have to agree with it. But the reality is I have learned through this process, through going through OTA and OTA level two, I've learned through this process how to sort of exist outside the parameters of what's going on in general with the economy, with the leadership in the United States. I don't, I'm, not I'm not always happy about the leadership in the United States, but the gift that I've been given is the sort of authority and audacity to run my own business and find success in the midst of pretty much any situation here. So I think it's a good lesson for the challenging work that you do that allows you to provide yourself with a certain amount of control over your own existence. 
And, you know, I got that through being in OTA. Heck, I made more money in the pandemic than I made the previous years because of leveling up through OTA. Because one truism, and I don't want to ramble too much, just the appropriate amount of time. But when I was in, uh, in the incredible R&B group known as Fortress, you guys may have heard of it. We were a big deal. You, know, you guys played at the Apollo Theater, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, we, we, we performed at the Apollo Theater. And as we exactly. referenced on the earlier podcast, I've got it on tape. So it, that means it's real. We were state known. <laughs> hey, bro. Yeah. I've I mean, never actually, been province yeah. known. Yeah, I mean, we, anything, we, so. yeah we were province known, uh, and state known. But in any case, when I was trying to get that thing done, that whole R&B singer thing, I ran into a guy that used to be a singer. He was a singer and a rapper. He ended up being a DJ. And I said, man, why, why did you switch to being a DJ? He said, because there always will be songs to play. But writing songs and recording songs, entertainers come and go. Genres of music are popular, but there will always be songs to play. If you're an OTA coach and you're working with a population of people that's specific, let me tell you, in a Republican-driven economy or in a Democratic-driven economy, there will always be clients to, that will hire you. When there's a recession, when there's not a recession, there will always be clients to hire you. You really insulate yourself from a lot of things by owning your own business, learning the skills that we teach you in the Online Trainer Academy, and applying them across the board. Relationships trump almost everything. I didn't mean you, I trumped the verb. Relationships supersede everything is what I'm trying to say. I'm not making a political statement here. And I learned that through the OTA. So thank you, Jonathan Goodman. You did one right thing in my life. Did, were you moved by that? That's better than our usual, usual start because I said stuff about things that said something. So there you go. You're welcome, listeners. <laughs> Yo, to anybody listening, remember, first, you're not paying for this. Right, right. <laughs> Always important to remember when you're listening to this podcast, you have paid us nothing. Always. Always start with that in mind. This was free. <laughs> always. 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 It listens so much better when you think about it that way. Yes, completely. <laughs> Next, I think what you said, Ren, is a fantastic transition into the topic for today, which is how to get started as an online trainer in 2021. Oh, that's our topic. God damn it, Ren. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that was the topic today. Man, I nailed that. That was awesome. <laughs> Amber's giving herself earmuffs, by the way. <laughs> she was straight earmuffs. <laughs> Language, Jonathan. In any case, so the topic is what? It's becoming an online trainer in 2020? Is that what it is? It's a great topic. Thank you. 21? Oh, 2021? All right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, becoming an online trainer, how to get started with online training in 2021. We're nearing the end of 2020. It has been, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Call it a tumultuous year, maybe. I would say conservatively that if 2020 was a person, yes. its birthstone would be crystal meth. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. They invented a new one. <laughs> you know, like like in Chinese culture, every year is the year of an animal. So, like I'm the year. I think I, I think I'm the year of the rat. I can't remember what cycle they go on, but they repeat. But they actually, Chinese culture invented a new year, invented a new animal <laughs> for, for children born in 2020. <laughs> is, is, is it a the Chinese, Chinese, the symbol is a Mexican mythological creature, the chupacabra? No, I think, I think actually more something like an anteater. An anteater? Oh my Just God. because it makes no sense. It makes no sense. That make, it Just, makes sense to me that that makes no sense. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Duck bill platypus is the official animal mascot of 20. It's, it's one of those weird things that every once in a while somebody's going to say, Hey, remember that time when? Right. And everybody's going to be like, Yo, that didn't make any sense. It's, right. like, it's like that time when yeah. I saw yeah. a platypus when I was traveling through Tasmania. I bet you were, Jonathan. Travel story. Here's a travel story for you. I'm Jonathan Goodman's travel stories. We decided to fly to Tasmania for four days, three nights when I was living in Australia. And we were on a bus. And like platypuses, platypusi, platypuses, I'm not sure. <laughs> Easy with the language there, big fella. They're, hard, they're, they're really hard to see because they're nocturnal. Like it's actually really weird to see one. Right. And anyway, we were going along in a bus, like going up and down. And there was, there was myself and there was another... <laughs> 
female who I became, I don't know, what's the best way to say this, friendly with on that trip, acquainted with on oh, that trip. Man. And we became acquainted because we were the two who always just didn't listen. Surprise, surprise, bit of my right. MO. I don't listen well to what other people tell me to do. So, Shocker. you know, like we go on a hike and we go super fast in front of everybody and then just like get lost and we held up the group for three hours because they had to come find us. <laughs> Stuff like that. We went, oh, my favorite story. Oh my God, I don't think I've ever told this story. So we went out at night. We were in this small town in Tasmania and like, Tas- like a small town in Tasmania is like, is like a small town. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we were at the one bar that was open for some reason playing darts, like taking shots. Keep in mind, this is like young idiot John. So this is not how I am now. But like, before I was married, when I was like young and stupid and whatever, that, that goes all before. But we were in this small boat and they were shutting it down because I guess bars closed like at 10 or 11 o'clock or whatever there. Maybe the one bar did. And we weren't ready to be done yet. And so we decided, we're like, oh, where should we go? And we're speaking to the boat tender. Like, oh, go to Jeff's house. What, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, yeah, just go to Jeff's house. Just go out in the cab and tell me you want to go to Jeff's house. So we literally walk out of the door. He's like, where are you going? We're like, Jeff's house? <laughs> so he's like, all right, cool. So he drives us, and it felt like it was a long time, but I don't know. We were pretty drunk, I guess. And, and we get there, and we get to this house. There's like three people in this house, and there's just this big dude, big belly, just sitting on the couch. We're like, hey, what's up? I'm John. And he's like, oh, hi, I'm Jeff. We're like, oh, cool. We're in the room. <laughs> So, oh my god so we hung out at Jeff's house for a while and I don't even remember what we did there but we were at Jeff's house for no reason at all in the middle of Tasmania in Australia and then we walk outside and we're like shit we don't know where Jeff's house is we don't know where our hostel is we don't know the name of it how in the world are we going to get back well fortunately it's like a small town Hey, Jeff, can you call that cabbie? He seemed like a buddy of yours. Yeah, sure. So he calls his buddy the cabbie. (laughs) We get in the cab and we're like, yeah, we got to go back to where we're staying, but we don't know what it's called. Can you just like drive around and try to find it? He's like, all right. So, (laughs) so. Horrible story. It's the worst. So he drives and I kid you not, but like. Maybe 10 seconds. We literally got in the car, closed the door. It was just like, drive, drive, drive. I was like, oh, that's it. Jeff lived like two doors down from the hostel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, if the bartender in Mexico, when he was shutting down the bar, was like, yo, ask the cabbie for Javier's house, I'd be like, be like nah, nah, I'm going to ask. You know, every time I hear Jonathan tell one of these stories, the entire PTBC flashes in front of my eyes. Like I see it blink out for a second. You know, one one decision, uh, you know, an inch to the left or right, and we're not sitting here talking because Jonathan Goodman never makes it to his thirties. God bless you. Jonathan. You've got a you've got a guardian angel on both shoulders. There have been a lot of things that, not to say that I shouldn't have survived, but like. The, well, there were signs let me that, say my, you, that my it life and business was going to be erratic and not follow a lot of guidelines of how to safely follow. <laughs> I got to go back and read some of your books, man, because I I clearly missed some things in them. In them, yeah. I, I don't think I, I feel like I didn't read them thoroughly. Start with ignite the fire. It's like it's like tolerance for risk, right? It's like, what's your tolerance for risk? What's your, what's your capacity for adventure, for exploration? Like, at the end of the day, we only got one life. Like, do you want to read about the world? Do you, do you want to go and live in it, right? I love that. What a beautiful, what a beautiful statement. Yeah. So if, if you that. want to see a platypus, go on a bus in Tasmania in Australia. And meet Jeff. And find a lady who was very nice. <laughs> And go to Jeff's house. It's <laughs> basically what we're saying. The side eye from Amber is so tremendous right now. I'm just it's, glad that my wife doesn't listen to these. Right. right. I'm glad. I'm glad too. Yeah. Follow us for more travel tips here on the online trainer show. Jonathan, we, we've got to talk about our subject. It's 
2020, it's, it, it will be 2021 by the end of your story, actually. But <laughs> becoming, becoming, a, becoming a, an online coach in 2021, what do you spill the deets, Jonathan? I know you got the good information. Spill you know, the deets. Don't keep it from us. Amber's having a Budweiser mid podcast. Yeah, so you. I don't blame you, her. Amber. Well, talk about, I mean, let's, let's first talk about why, you know, you're forced into online fitness as a personal trainer. I mean, this was the case before COVID. Right. This is going to be the case after COVID. In my experience, right, I trained clients for eight years. And for most of it, I wasn't particularly happy. Like I was scared. Like I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that I wasn't happy. I liked training my clients a lot. I liked going to the gym. I liked working the day to day. But I was scared because my earning potential was maxed pretty early on. Right. And that's with super long hours, which meant I had no time for friends or family or girlfriend or anything like that. And so this idea of being relatively new into your career, working way too hard, working way too many hours with like not that much opportunity is actually kind of frightening. And then I got injured, which I've told that story before. You know, I got injured. I got tripped playing hockey and I strained a hamstring. Like not like like not a big injury, but I was off my feet for two weeks. And when you're off your feet for two weeks and you're like, I can't make a living, you're like, yo, this is not right. This is not something that I can clearly raise a family on that depend on me. This is not something that is going to give me the freedom to travel, the freedom to, I mean, obviously I like travel. <laughs> You've been paying attention to this podcast. Obviously. obviously. To, to go on an adventure. I mean, I, you know, I always think of that. I knew that there was something more that I was destined for more. I never wanted to be known as just a personal trainer. I was always kind of embarrassed to say that I was a personal trainer at parties because I always felt like I was more than that. I felt like that word had some connotation that was not particularly negative, but didn't accurately represent the quality to which I, I thought that I brought to the table and that I wanted to bring to the table and what I was doing. Right. And so this was way before COVID, but I was like, I needed something that was systemized that allowed me to scale my business. I needed something that didn't necessarily remove me from training clients. That wasn't ever the vision. I mean, that's how it ended up going down, but that wasn't ever the vision, but I needed to figure out a way to, to make more and less time with a better schedule, like, and potentially make more money. You know, there are certainly people that I know that make, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year, personal training clients with nothing else. They're outliers. And, and obviously it's different, you know, depending on where you live. If you live in like a big city where you could charge a hundred to $300 an hour, right? there are other people who, most people who train clients, it just doesn't exist. You know, I love people talking about how much money they make as a trainer. It's like, yeah, because you live in downtown Manhattan. Right. You're making $200,000 a year and you're in debt. Right. Like, <laughs> your your $100,000 is like 20000 in North Carolina. <laughs> that's it. So, I mean, uh, good job, bro. Like, <laughs> you know. It's cool great. story, bro. Cool story. <laughs> so the question of how to, how to actually do it is, is, is a good question. So I want to walk you through the steps right now. So step one is, is pretty simple. We talk about this all the time. Decide what types of clients you want to work with online. All the time, we hear trainers say, there's so many online trainers. Like, there's so many options. Why would anybody want to work with me? And the answer is actually really easy. The answer is because you're not those other trainers. You're you. And immediately, that gives you an advantage over every other trainer out there even fitness influencers, even Instagram trainers with thousands or hundreds of thousands of online followers. The secret to training online training is to be the right person to a few people. Like when you do the math, $72,000 a year is 30 clients paying you 200 bucks a month. You don't need 10,000 Instagram followers. You don't need a massive marketing budget. You need to know how to uniquely set yourself apart. We call this the 1% uniqueness factor in the online trainer academy. And the people who really pay attention to this part of the program, which is like the first major part of the program, thrive. They crush it. And unfortunately, a lot of people kind of gloss over it. And when you gloss over it, you're like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm unique. I, I, you know, I train mothers. <laughs> nah, bro. Don't set yourself apart. That's how you compete with everybody. That's how you're going to be priced to the bottom I mean, you've got 
billion and now a trillion dollar company entering the online streaming fitness market. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to compete with a $5 or $10 a month Netflix for fitness service. Right. The only way that you can compete is understanding that there is still a large and growing percentage of humans out there that are willing and eager to pay premium amounts for fitness. I mean, when I was personal training clients, the idea of having your own fitness equipment at home was mm-hmm. insane. Like basically nobody did it. Now you have people even middle to low middle class that are buying a $3,000 spin bike on installments. There are so many signs. And I mean, this is a lot of the work that we're doing as we understand the industry more and more. So I, I won't talk to you about all the research that we're doing, but like there are so many signs that are crystal clear that show that the North American and European, particularly in, in Australia, New Zealand, fitness markets increasingly are spending way more money on their personal fitness than they ever did in aggregate. And they're spending that money on premium services. Mm-hmm. This is happening, whether you're a part of it or not. But if you're a part of it and you show up to these people in capacities that others don't because they're larger businesses, perhaps, that really want to scale – and they can't scale on this individual basis, or they just don't listen to the online trainer show podcast. And they should. You know, so they don't understand, or they're not students of the online trainer academy, like, or they gloss over that section, to be honest, in the online trainer. They never stand out. I mean, go back and listen to some of our old episodes about this. Listen to Ren and Carolita and Amber talking about the, how, you know, they've worked backwards and said, okay, here's you know, the 1%, here's the language that I use to speak to them. Here's what my group name is. Here's what my program name is. Like everything aligns. This is why they're able to make it work. This is why they're able to make it work well and then waste time on a podcast like this with me. 100%. And like, I do not pay them much to be on here. Like this is not worth their time. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So that's number one. Number two was to create a template with three or four training phases for each client. And... When I first introduced templates to trainers and said that they should use them, I actually got a lot of kickback. Say, no, how could you ever, you know, tell me to build a template for my clients? That that's not training. It's like, yeah, it is, because actually the reality of it is an algorithm, a programming algorithm can probably build a better program than you right now. Where you need to show up is you need to show up that last little bit to individualize it. And you need to listen and take in feedback from your client and adapt those templates. But your original programs that you make for your client, like, to be honest, I'm not saying this for everybody, but like most people who are out there, there are computer systems that can build better programs than them. Right. A coach is not valuable because they build a workout program. What you have to understand is that most clients fit pretty well into categories. In any setting, the workout that you're going to write for like a 40-year-old man who wants to lose belly fat is going to be pretty similar to the last one you wrote for that type of client. There might be some injuries a little bit here and there that are going to be different, but think about this from a logical argument. If you write the single best program, or if you have in your hands the single best program in the world for that type of client, if you sit down with another client who's similar to your first one, and you write another program, by definition, one of those two programs is going to be second best. So you should always start with the best. You should always aim to improve that over time. And then you adapt it for each client based on the onboarding process and initial assessment. And depending on how sophisticated you are, you can use technology to do that. You can do that manually. And then you continue to modify it over time. You have to understand that some parts of the template are going to change from client to client, like specific exercises. Well, the exercise category or movement pattern is likely going to stay the same. The specific exercise you use, that might change, you know, when you take into account client experience, skill level, previous injuries, limitations, okay? Grips or implements might change based off of what the client has access to, Mm -hmm. based off of what the client prefers. Could be something as simple as you have a client with small hands, and so, <laughs> why are you laughing, Amber? <laughs> well, no, but I mean. I got it. <laughs> Amber got it, right? <laughs> I get it, but. 
<laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> hey, Jonathan Goodman here. This podcast is made possible thanks to people like you. Here's a quick word from our sponsors. Are you still trying to pick your online training software? If so, let me make this easy for you. Go with PT Distinction. It's truly the best, and I'm not just saying that because they're our sponsor. We actually use PT Distinction for our own online fitness business, online trainer coaching, and we're really happy with it. From onboarding to programming to client communication, PT Distinction has everything you need to run your online fitness business smoothly, and it's super simple to use. Now, normally they offer a free 30-day trial, but as a listener of the Online Trainer Show, you get a free 60-day trial, so you can make sure you love them before spending a dime. If you want to deliver first-class service to your clients while reclaiming your time, then visit onlinetrainer.com slash PTD to sign up for your free 60-day trial today. If you're a fitness and nutrition coach that's looking to master online coaching so that you can help more people, make more money, and have more freedom, then the Online Trainer Academy can help. OTA gives you the framework, knowledge, and support to have predictable success with your online coaching business. From marketing to business development to how to assess and motivate your clients online, it is constantly updated and refreshed to keep up with a dynamic market. Not only that, OTA is proven. In seven years, we've helped over 30,000 coaches in 87 countries go online. Truth is, we know what works, so you can get right to the success part. And in case you're busy working a full-time job or you're a full-time parent, know that you can go at your own pace. There's no deadlines to complete OTA and you have lifetime access. That said, if you are ready to make a rapid change and finish the course in the next 8 to 12 weeks, you can expect to invest 3 to 5 hours each week on the program. And here's the best part, if you join today, you will make an extra $1,000 a month in 90 days or I'll give you your money back. So if you're ready to build the fitness business you want and make the money you deserve, go to onlinetrainer.com slash academy to enroll today. And I hope to see you in there. I'm not saying this is like an overgeneralization, but from my experience training clients, women generally had smaller hands than men did. Right, right. And so if I had a female client, am I going to give them the same type of deadlift, for example, with a thick barbell because right. their limitation once they get a little bit of strength is often not the actual weight on the barbell is their grip. Mm-hmm. So what's a great different grip or implement to replicate that? We'll use a landmine, get them gripping with both hands intertwined around the landmine barbell. And now you can do a deadlift sort of holding it underneath you, right? Scooping it where you're able to put more weight on the bar and where the grip is no longer an issue. That's one example. I had another client, for example, who had a disfigurement. And so one of his hands, his right hand was, was deformed. It had been deformed since birth. And so we couldn't grip. He kind of needed to like hook his arm around it. And so what's an example of a, of a different exercise? Well, clearly he's not going to be able to do any kind of back squat, front squat, anything like that. He can't do goblet squat. But what he could do is zercher squats. Mm-hmm. which is where you cross your arms over and you put the barbell on your elbows. Mm-hmm. That was an unbelievable exercise. For me. So that's the kind of stuff that could change, right? Depending on client to client. Stuff that won't change are things like programming considerations. Like if you know that exercise one is going to be like a six to eight rep, three or four set minute to minute and a half break, that's probably not going to change. You might change the exercise. You might change the grip. But you're not going to change the sets and reps and, and tempo and rest or anything like that. Because what you want to get out of the programming is going to be consistent. Order of movement patterns probably won't change. The workout split over the week, how, you know, how many times they need to train. Like If you have a client that has high hypertrophy goals, mm-hmm. like lofty hypertrophy goals, and they're like, yo, I can only work out twice a week. That ain't going to work. So then you need to say to them, okay, well, then your goal needs to change. But if you know that for certain results that a client wants to get, you're like, all right, you got to work out a minimum of four days a week, like ideally five or six. Mm -hmm. That's not going to change if the goal is consistent. You might need to adjust the goal based off of the client at that point in time. And that's where you need to have an honest conversation. So templates are huge. Build your templates. And the templates work backwards from your ideal client, right? If you have an ideal client and you know what their goals are going to be, you can build 
a few templates for people who fit into that, and you'll like basically hit them. Next is compile a video library of the exercises in your online training programs. You're not going to be there to demonstrate the exercises, but you need videos to show them how to do it. And you don't need to have your own. There's actually tons of this stuff out there. <laughs> and so it's a huge time saver. I mean, ultimately, yeah, sure, maybe you might want to make your own. But like to do it now with good video quality, like it takes a long time. It could be pretty expensive to do if you don't have that stuff set up. And to be honest, it's another thing for you to do and another thing for you to learn that you probably don't have time for or attention for right now. So create a spreadsheet. Now that you have your templates, right? You see how this is all working backwards. You got your ideal client. You got your templates. You know what exercises is in them. Find a great YouTube tutorial on every single one of the exercises in your template. Put it in a spreadsheet. You're done. But you should have that resource. And yes, you absolutely have permission to use other people's videos. As long as you don't pretend it's yours. <laughs> so you can embed somebody else's video on YouTube. You can share the link to somebody else's video on YouTube. You cannot download that video and upload it to your software. Attribution needs to be on there. Step four, decide if you want to use software. You know, our, our sponsors for this podcast, PT Distinction, they're great. If you do decide you want to use software, we definitely recommend them. That's what we use to run our online training business, online trainer coaching. At the beginning, though, you might not need to use software. Like, I'm a big fan of bootstrapping. And so get the clients first and then plug them into the software after. This idea, it, the amount of messages that I've gotten that just blow my mind. <laughs> We've um, got a GIF for that. Oh, my God. We do have a GIF for that. The amount yeah. of times that I've gotten a message, I've asked somebody, it's like, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about the Online Trainer Academy, but I haven't joined yet. Oh, what's stopping you? Oh, I signed up for the software for 100 bucks a month, and I don't have any clients yet. So... You know, I'm waiting to get clients to pay that off, and then I'll be able to afford the online trainer account. It's like, what the hell? Why would you buy something and spend money on something to deliver a program to your clients when you have no clients and no program? Doesn't that seem ass backwards to you, right? So why not <laughs> either? I mean, what, I mean, obviously, my suggestion is do the online trainer academy, get clients. And then get the software and plug them in afterwards. Right. But even if you don't do the online trainer academy, like bust your butt, get those clients first and then slip them into the software. <laughs> um, so decide if you want to use software first. And if you do, PT Distinction is great. Onlinetrainer.com slash PTD, you get 60 days free. Totally cool. Next, decide on the best package and online training pricing model. And so there's kind of four different models, and I'll go through them all super, super fast. There's one-to-one, one-to-a-few, which is basically one trainer works with five to 30 clients. Price range is generally about 100 to 500 a month. The reason that we like it a lot is it's realistic, it's stable. It doesn't require a big change in your service. It doesn't require you to learn a lot of new things, right? I always say... And this is our, our second guiding principle in the Online Trainer Academy. What would this look like if it were easy? Mm -hmm. You should not need to learn how to build advanced funnels. You should not need to learn paid advertising software, build a website, anything like that to get started. Right? That stuff can be added in later if you want to scale. So that's why I really like this one to a few. It is a little bit slower to start and it lacks the scalability that you might ultimately want. That said, you could easily make 100000 a year make 100 to 100 i would say it caps out at about 150 for this reason like this is the model that is gloriously unsexy you never see it like taught with people who are trying to like sell you on high ticket models because it doesn't sound sexy but it's the model that we teach in level one of the online trainer academy because it's where basically everybody should start but keep in mind it's where very few will end up i think it's very important to know Next up, you've got high ticket transformation programs. This is kind of the high ticket model. One trainer works with a small to medium number of affluent clients, all of which want to achieve a specific measurable goal, lower weight, smaller dress size, bigger arms, shoulders, whatever, in a defined time period. Generally, this is about $1,000 to $5,000 for 12 weeks is what you charge. It can be extremely profitable. It allows you to commit more of your time to an individual client. And marketing is more seamless because you sell a specific outcome versus open-ended coaching. It's always easy to sell an outcome. The cons are, there's a long and complex and difficult to learn sales and conversion process. 
most sales require content paid ads and at least two phone calls per client, which means it also requires well-developed sales skills. So you see what I'm saying? It requires you to up-level or build entirely new skill sets, which is fine, but you got to know that going into it. And then it's, it's kind of uncertain and fragile, like losing, if you only have five clients, losing a single client is 20% of your income. And because it's such a long sales cycle, it can take a long time to replace them. So it's pretty fragile. It works really well for trainers who are more seasoned and willing to invest a substantial amount of time and resources into creating content, developing sales skills, investing in paid advertising. This is actually the model we teach in level two of the online trainer pen. And so I love this model for the right type of person, but it's only available to coaches already making a thousand a month online. Like basically like you've done this, you're doing all right with it, like a thousand online or more, right? You've done this, you're doing all right with it. Now it's time to scale up. You've got hybrid, which meshes. I mean, we have a whole nother episode on it. You can listen to, but it, it leverages technology combining in-person with online coaching, generally 50 to $200 a month, plus whatever you charge for online for an in-person session. And I won't get into the nuts and bolts of it because we've already covered this in an entirely new episode, but it's great for gym-based trainers who don't want to stop working with clients or people who just like people, but need a bit more scalable model mm -hmm. that treats clients better. And then the final model is this idea of the low-end membership. Basically, one trainer works simultaneously with 50 plus clients who pay lower fees, usually through a membership platform, where you're like creating content, basically. There might be some coaching element like 10 to 50 bucks a month. It's extremely scalable if you can make it work. But it's actually the only model that I don't teach in any of our programs because the only case that I recommend it is if the trainer has a huge platform with a huge organic following generating thousands of free leads. We have an episode way back, I think it was episode 10 or 11, on why we don't teach the membership model and why we really don't like it. Listen to that if you're thinking about it. And it will turn you away from it. When you actually understand the realities of the business and the numbers and the finances of it, it will scare the heck out of you. It is just a bad idea. You will um, wake with night sweats after you will having wake up with night sweats. <laughs> to that to that episode. Yeah, bas basically for that one, if you're not Dwayne the Rock Johnson, just stay away from <laughs> just stay away from uh, that. Moment. Yeah, I mean there are there are there are exceptions. There are exceptions to it. And it could be like a good lead in. Like it could be if you already have a high ticket program that's generating a lot of leads, it could be a really nice thing that you basically build on the bottom of it. But whenever anybody comes to me and says they want to do that, I'm like, why don't you just scale this high ticket thing? If you have ample leads right. of people paying you $1,000 or more, just hire more coaches. Right. right. Why are you even bothering dealing with customers who are going to pay you 10 or 50 bucks a month? Makes no sense. Last up, step six, create an application. The only reason that you generate traffic and market online is to attract a prospect and persuade them to enter their information so that you can follow up. If you're creating content for any other reason than to attract a person and gather their information to sell to them or to follow up, you're doing the internet wrong. <laughs> Sorry, like you are. The better and more efficiently you do this, the more successful you're going to become. It's that simple. So an application is a virtual handshake. Gather their information, build rapport. That's it. And then follow up with them on, on some sort of a sales call, sales emails. If you're, if you're good in like the DMs, you could follow up with them in the DMs. There's a bunch of different ways to convert them. But those are the nuts and bolts. I guess step seven, I guess the final step, step is like get a payment processing service. If you've never done business on the internet, like sign up for PayPal so that you can take people's money. Mm-hmm. That's basically it. Like those are your steps to get going. And then it's just a matter of executing forward. You know, within each step, you just get better and better and better and better and better. Basically attracting people, getting people, understanding your market better helps you attract people, helps you understand how to build better templates, understands how to create your video library better, understands how to build a better application. Like it all kind of works backwards from there. But that's the nuts and bolts of how to do it in 2021. I love it. Jonathan Goodman has gone into the future for you out there in, in podcast land. He traveled into the future, took information, which I think creates a butterfly effect or something. It depends on the movie you've seen, but took information from the future, bought it back here along with the V-neck. Apparently they have V-necks in the future. And uh, he's educated all of us about how to become the coach 
in 2021. It's been a thrilling episode of the Online Trainer Show here today. Catalina is off screen. The mayor is taking Zoom meetings in his boxers. Amber's got her best Where's Waldo outfit on today. Jonathan's got a V-neck and I'm wearing a hat and everything is right with the world. All is right in the world. All is right in the world. Once again, we solved all of your problems in 50 minutes or less here on the Online Trainer Show. Don't forget to go to online trainer show uh, slash online trainer dot oh com slash podcast. Just be two well, it was episodes bound, in. It was bound to happen again at some point. I you know? paid sixty three thousand dollars for that domain. That's, that's to make right. it easy to say. Yeah. <laughs> I just took a little bit of change off the top, Jonathan. What's what's a little bit of embezzlement between friends? Uh, this is audio embezzlement. So we're still wrapped up in the confusion and stress and sex appeal of the U.S. election here. It's a sexy, sexy time down here in the States. So perhaps next Tuesday, we'll still be talking about it. Who knows? And th thanks so much for tuning in to the Online Trader Show. I can't believe I told that story about Tasmania. Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting story. And, I, and again, I saw my future flash before my eyes because we almost didn't make it to this point solely based on your decision-making skills in your 20s. I don't think I've ever told that story to anybody before. And obviously, I made it a little bit more PG than it was. Uh, well, I'm quite sure of that, Jonathan. I'm quite sure. That no we, need to expand on it here. We did We did a hike, I remember, oh, to the top of this mountain. I think here it was called go. Cradle Mountain. I got to fact check that. I think it was called Cradle Mountain. <laughs> but we did a hike to the top of it. And I remember nobody would go right up to the top because it was so dangerous because it was so cloudy and like you couldn't see anything. And me and this girl just like sprinted up to the top. And we have this picture of us just like surrounded in clouds. You couldn't see more than like a foot in front of you. Yeah. And there was, I mean, this was a like a, this was like a drop off. Yeah, I know. It was, it was dangerous. We're going to need to cut off Dr. Allison's internet before the show airs, Jonathan. I know. <laughs> yeah, some, somebody get the utility company on the line and clip the internet over at the Goodman home because it's going to be a rough Christmas this year around there. Oh, that's right. There's no Christmas there. I forgot. I she forgot. doesn't. She doesn't listen to those. Yeah, she don't do Christmas. But a rough New Year. She is completely lost. In once Calvin came along, she completely lost interest in my work. Well, I get that. I get that. I can't say that the rest of us don't feel the same, Jonathan. Jingle, 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 jingle. Jingle. This is the online trainer show. Trainer show. Trainer show. This is.